Jokes about Onimai practically write themselves. For example, if I had a nickel for every time a character in Onimai peed herself, you'd probably be so shocked that the setup to this joke exists in the first place that you wouldn't even hear the punchline. It's three, by the way. So, the premise of Onimai is that our main character Mahiro gets turned into a girl via a science experiment. No, no, wait. I'm underselling it. Mahiro gets turned into a middle school girl by his mad scientist sister Mihari against his, or I guess now her, will. The show is readily sexual at nearly every turn, and although I personally don't think the show is going in this direction, there have been no shortage of people positing that the show's main sibling dynamic may at some point take a turn for the Sakai. At a glance, Onimai looks like the second coming of Aero Manga Sensei. But that's not really what I want to talk about in this video. You see, I love this show, because Onimai is more than fan service. The Onimai anime is an adaptation of a 2017 manga written and illustrated by Neko Tofu. I haven't read it, so I can't speak to its quality. The anime then began airing in January 2023, released by Studio Bind. Onimai, at its core, is the story of two siblings, Mahiro and Mihari Oyama. And I think that the show manages to capture the relationship between these two siblings in a legitimately heartfelt, intimate, and powerful way. Mahiro, at the start of the show, is a hikikomori that hasn't left her house in two years. She's spent those years playing video games that are... er... very safe for Wank, rarely leaving her bedroom or interacting with her family. The show does a pretty solid job of believably selling Mahiro as a hikikomori, with her absolutely filthy room, Mihari forcing Mahiro to bathe shortly after they begin interacting again because she smells awful, and in a detail I absolutely love, how in episode 1, Mihari leaves an outfit at the door of Mahiro's bedroom, which is probably how she gave Mahiro a lot of things over the past two years, and presumably how she received the spiked drink that turned her into a girl in the first place. Oh, Oh yeah, Mihari. Mihari puts some radical sex-changing drugs in Mahiro's cola. She's a genius, and despite being younger than Mahiro, has her life far more put together. She's currently doing research work at a college, and is such a brainiac that her default outfit is a lab coat. Her sissification experiment then, if you will, is actually revealed to be not just the terrifying product of her whims, but also an elaborate scheme designed to turn her big brother's life around. In essence, Onimai is a neat rehabilitation show, and Mihari serves as the mastermind sparking Mahiro's development. Mahiro and Mihari have fundamentally opposite personalities. Mahiro at home is blunt, irresponsible, lazy, and wants nothing more than to coop up in her room all day. However, for much of the show, once people other than Mihari are around, her lax comportment regresses into shivery shambles in a way that's oddly adorable to witness. Mihari, then, is responsible, kind, and actually has a social life. However, she becomes a lot more blunt and teasing around her sister, which helps make their interactions delightful to watch. In addition to that, the two just really, really care about each other. Especially Mihari, whose day is made by being called Onechan and being able to dress up her sister, and who cries tears of joy every time Mahiro makes even a single iota of progress towards self-improvement. At least for the first two episodes, I wouldn't blame anyone for finding it weird just how crazy attached Mihari is to Mahiro, considering they've barely seen each other for the past two years. But the way Episode 3's ending recontextualizes their relationship by expositing their backstory makes it click in a way that not only makes complete sense, but is also fascinating to me. Their relationship actually started off as an ordinary, if stronger than average, sibling bond. This was to the point that Mihari's prime motivator in working hard at becoming a genius was to gain the attention and affection of her older brother. But as she became smarter and received accolades from those around her, Mahiro began feeling more and more inferior to his sister. Mahiro, after all, was just an otaku with questionable social skills. Despite being older than his sister, he had accomplished far less. Eventually, he found it so difficult to face the world in his current pathetic state that he became a hikikomori. I absolutely love this backstory. 
All of a sudden, when Mihari cries with joy at something as simple as Mahiro making her porridge, or goes out of her way to dedicate a significant amount of her time to rehabilitating her sister, it's recontextualized with the fact that Mahiro's isolation probably weighed heavy on her mind nearly every day during those two years, and that being able to see her sister again, walking, talking, and smiling, has brought her happiness she couldn't begin to put into words. It's a once broken sibling dynamic dynamic that ends up healed in the show. As Mihari remarks at the end of episode 3 as the two are eating together, it's just like the old days, even if their roles are reversed. Needless to say, their bond is absolutely precious, and I love seeing it. Now you may be wondering, hey, uh, what does turning Mahiro into a girl have to do with turning her life around? Well, if I had to speculate, from how easily Mahiro slips into the role of a girl, she's probably had issues with gender identity her whole life, and I imagine Mihari recognized that, which is why she chose to turn Mahiro into a girl. Now, is slipping hardcore HRT into your older brother's drink without his permission ethical? N no. Is Mihari a bad person for doing this? Eh, she has the best of intentions, even if her methods are more than a little questionable. Does it matter if Mihari's methods are morally good? Not really. It's fiction, so I don't have to judge Mihari's actions as if she were a real person doing all that. Okay, but why a middle school girl specifically? Why was that necessary? On the one hand, yeah, it's probably an excuse to put a bunch of lollies in the show. But on the other hand, and hear me out, alright? I actually think that Mahiro being turned into a middle schooler specifically is narratively and thematically poignant. It was just a social experiment, guys! I promise! It's effectively the same reason why Rudius from Mushoku Tensei was turned into a child, to have a complete reset in life, or at least as much of one you can get while maintaining the same brain. Not only is turning Mahiro into a middle schooler honestly giving her a body more befitting of her mental maturity, but it also gives her a chance to redo much of her life. It allows her to build up a social circle from scratch from a more secure footing. She has the chance to grow up with people and attend school again, and be forced to sit next to and befriend others at school. And of course, it'd be amiss of me to not mention the trans wish fulfillment aspect of the narrative, the chance to get a soft reset on life, but now as a female. It's a story about getting a second chance at life, and at least within the narrative, age regression feels like a pretty natural mechanic to include. Onimai's narrative is designed to gradually ease Mahiro back into social interaction. First, she gets a freebie, Mihari. She's her now older sister, and someone she's known for her whole life and generally knows how to behave towards. Next, she's introduced to Kaidi Hozuki. Kaidi is, at first, very intimidating to Mahiro, as she's a Gyaru. However, she actually turns out to be the caring older sister type. When Kaidi finds out that Mahiro pissed herself, a frequent occurrence in this show, because the restroom at the movie theater had a long line, Kaidi, instead of making fun of her, understands the situation immediately and deals with it in an empathetic and mature manner. She simply takes on a consoling tone, buys Mahiro a change of underwear, and promises not to tell Mihari. Thus, the piss scene becomes the wholesome piss scene. I can't believe the words that just left my mouth. Kaidi is also responsible, a good cook, and used to dealing with people Mahiro's physical age due to having a younger sister herself. The reason why Kaidi makes such a good next step for Mahiro is because, although outgoing, she's non-judgmental, kind, and mature for her age. She allows Mahiro a lot of leniency in the way she interacts with her. Mahiro can literally piss herself without a word of teasing from Kaidi. It's a low-stakes environment where Mahiro can stretch her legs and get a feel for how human interaction works again. Next is Momiji Hozuki, Kaidi's younger sister, and someone who is around the same age as Mahiro is physically. Although Momiji is kind, just like her sister, she's less mature and a bit more serious and uptight. Momiji is essentially Mahiro's tutorial on how to interact with middle school girls, i.e. people her age, which is a skill she'll need when she eventually enrolls in middle school. But because Momiji and Kaidi are, quite literally, made from the same DNA, she's still kind and relatively easy to interact with. Later on, Momiji develops a crush on Mahiro. 
Okay, so I ranted about how excited I was for the Yuri and Onimai in my Discord server, but then a certain French person told me that Momiji wasn't in love with Mahiro, and that they're actually just really good friends. But then while writing this video, I referenced the wiki just to see other people's interpretations of the characters, because that's just something I do while writing these things. It helps put my opinions into context. But the wiki totally vindicates me here. Let's look at the evidence. Momiji is incredibly protective of Mahiro, getting visibly jealous when primarily Asahi gets touchy-feely or overly friendly with her. They go out shopping on Christmas, which is a romantic holiday in Japan. Not only is Momiji incredibly excited to go on this pseudo-date, but there's very clear effort to frame them as a potential couple, with many a pictures taken of them together and Mahiro getting noticeably worried about people thinking she and Momiji are a couple, because they, you know, totally look like a couple. There's also a bit where Momiji considers trying on a coat, and Mahiro blushes and tells her she can't wear it. The reason for this being that Momiji would look too jaw-droppingly attractive in it for Mahiro to handle. Mio ships the two of them together, but then again, she ships everyone. But then, when Mihari sees Mahiro and Momiji together on Christmas, she immediately begins teasing Mahiro about dating her, and Kaidi also takes a picture of Momiji and Mahiro together, which she then teases Momiji about. Three characters noticing Mahiro and Momiji's potential as a couple is a pattern. So am I making up the Yuri in this show? Post your opinions in the comments down below. But yeah, I'm not. I mean, they could always leak or Riko us, but if that ends up being the case, it would be a far cry from my fault for seeing all these blindingly obvious hints as, you know, hints. I didn't even go into all of them. That's how hard they're setting this Yuri ship up. Speaking of Yuri, Mio Murosaki. She's got her mind on the Yuri and the Yuri on her mind, a sapphic grind set of the highest order, CEO of Lesbians Unlimited. She hates kissing girls, but loves girls kissing, and every cute feminine face is a canvas upon which to imagine a brand new twisted permutation of Maria Holic. Did anyone else watch Maria Holic? Am I the only one? Along with Mio, we get Asahi Oka, a dim-witted Genki girl who has no problem getting touchy-feely with Mahiro, much to Momiji's chagrin. Mio and Asahi took a bit longer to win me over than the rest of the cast. Actually, I'm still kinda waiting on Asahi to do something that wins her a proper spot in my heart, although she has tons of potential and strides have been made in realizing that potential. Mio, on the other hand, has won me over at this point. At first, she can come off as a bit of a one-dimensional gag character, but she does in fact have a personality. She's rather self-conscious and probably the most feminine character in the cast. She's also a kind and dependable person underneath all the eccentricity. What endears me to Mio the most, though, is in the most recent episode of the show as of writing this, episode 10. Mio finally confides with Mahiro that she's a Yuri Khan and a Yuri manga obsessive, which is received with an astonishing, I know. However, she's very clearly self-conscious about her interests. Later on, Mahiro tells Mio that no one should feel the need to hide the things they like, with things in this case referring to the type of sexual content in fiction you like, i.e. there's no need to be embarrassed about having a fetish most find odd. This line, then, is a meta-commentary on the nature of Onimai itself. Onimai is, obviously, what many people would consider pretty degenerate. But this scene brings the show from something that simply features odd sexual content to a show that comments on odd sexual content. And whether you agree with the show's messaging or not, I think it's pretty undeniably clever writing. It brings this running gag and Mio's self-consciousness therein into the realm of being thematically relevant to the show, and retroactively makes many of the scenes that many may deem as, you know, weird, feel more narratively important and in line with an actual message that the show aims to argue in favor of. Also, I, I just need to get this out there somehow, but in episode 10, my hero literally says, just try to control yourself when real people are involved. I'm not making this up. That is like, verbatim, a line that's just in the show. It's so cursed. The characters are making fiction-is-fiction fiction arguments in the dialogue of the show. It's hilarious. I love it.
It should be pretty clear why Asahi and Miyo specifically are Mahiro's next stepping stone on the path to getting good at talking to people. They're simply more difficult people to approach and interact with than the Hozuki sisters. While the Hozuki sisters are well-mannered and easy for pretty much anyone to talk to, Asahi is a ball of energy who wears an adorable dinosaur-slash-Godzilla-I-can't-tell costume to a slumber party, and Mio is… well, just like me for real. They're both fairly socially unorthodox, and not exactly the first thing you picture when you're asked to envision polite society, because Mahiro's already gotten decent at talking to polite society. It's now time to face impolite society. With Mahiro getting the gist of talking to people, and now having been introduced to the next two members of the cast, and the added challenge of dealing with someone who has a crush on her, the narrative, and Mihari, have deemed her as being in the right headspace and having the right people around her to finally enter middle school, with Momiji, Asahi, and Mio acting as her friend group at school. And with that, Mahiro's gradually gone from a no-life neat to a functioning student with a budding romance. Real quick, I want to get into the visuals of this show, because oh my lordy, it is phenomenal looking. Obviously, it has great animation. It's a bind anime, go figure. While not every shot is as stuffed with animation as the last, the show nonetheless manages to keep the visual quality consistent throughout its run. In every episode, there are at least a few legitimately amazing cuts of animation, and every time a fanservice scene begins, you know the animation is gonna pop off. Here's a Genga of Mihari getting railed. Onimai is directed by Shingo Fuji, and this is his first time directing a full TV anime. Needless to say, this is stellar work for a first-time director, although it's also worth mentioning that this show is loaded with episode directors, each of whom are also helping the show pop in their own way. Episode 2 in particular, episode directed and storyboarded by Eri Ire, has shots that just take my breath away with how utterly creative they are every single time I see them. This shot where Mahiro is looking at the public bath with this fisheye lens effect that moves as Mahiro turns her head, like, I cannot emphasize enough how utterly creative this is. I have never seen a shot quite like this in any other show, period. But even outside of episode 2, the show consistently has great shot composition or shots that show the events of the story in a way that sparks the imagination. Like in episode 1, where Mihari checking out Mahiro's new female body is shown to us from a distance, with the proverbial camera set atop a desk next to Mahiro's keyboard. Or in episode 5, when Mahiro excitedly taking photos in a picture booth is communicated entirely through the movements of her feet with the camera just outside the booth itself. Or in episode 6, when the camera makes a spiral motion towards Mahiro's eye to communicate her despair. A directing quirk that's consistent throughout the entire show, and is most likely a product of Shingo Fuji's creative mind, is how the environments in the show are oft depicted with low opacity repeating patterns, which give the show more of a poppy, almost handmade feel. There are even some Nai Bochi-esque cuts of the most bombastic animation and directing that you could possibly ask for. Like in episode 10, when a bunch of boys desperate for candy on Valentine's Day gets depicted as the literal zombie apocalypse with dramatic lighting and great animation to boot. Or when Mahiro gets transported into a video game world to communicate how upset she gets when she realizes that one of the games she likes came out before her classmates were even born. Did you know that this show has pretty color? You probably did, because you've been seeing clips of this show this entire video. Its cream color palette is so distinct in its execution and looks so great. Thank you, Makiko Doi. Also, this show is a reaction image factory. I had to actively restrain myself from screenshotting every other shot because the characters' faces are so consistently screen -cappable. In particular, this show loves spiral eyes. My favorite face is this one from Mio. Look at how adorable she is. Just look at her. She's so cute. I could, frankly, go on about this show's visuals, but that'd take too long, so for now, let's move on. Let me die! 
When this show began airing, I ended up starting a weekly Twitter thread on the show, documenting all my thoughts on it. I stopped after episode 5 because the Zari Goto video was becoming so much of a time leech that I fell behind on Onimai. Luckily, I had this video on my schedule, so now I can get some of my general thoughts on the show out there in a way that can be seen by far more people than if it were just a Twitter thread. Going into 2023, there were two anime I was excited for, Mushoku Tensei Season 2 and Onimai. Both of these shows are made by Studio Bind, and in Onimai's case, I was hyped for it primarily because it was made by Studio Bind, and I'm happy to say that Bind has a second W under its belt. We're two for two with great Bind anime, both sporting equally great animation. Depressingly, if KU's tweets are anything to go by, I reckon they are, this sheer quality isn't necessarily a product of better pay or working conditions, but nonetheless, they are far surpassing most of the competition in terms of how much talent they can bring onto a single project to really make it the best it possibly can be. No matter what you think of Mushoku Tensei and Onimai overall, I think it's pretty hard to deny that their adaptations have set the bar in terms of quality. Not everyone thinks they're perfect adaptations. I know some light novel readers of Mushoku Tensei prefer the book's more thorough exploration of the story, but nonetheless, for most people, these are the best adaptations they could hope for. I don't think it's a coincidence that both of Studio Bind's projects so far have been neat rehabilitation shows heavily featuring sexuality. Onimai and Mushoku Tensei, despite differing vastly in genre and tone, nonetheless share some of the same themes, and if I had to guess, this was an intentional choice meant to give this studio a clear identity from the beginning. Granted, I've gotten some pushback on this theory, because you need three to definitively suss out a pattern, but nonetheless, I'm sticking with this theory for now. They'll branch out from this topic eventually for sure, but for now, this is what Bind does. Really well animated, really sexual, neat rehabilitation shows. And well, I'm a fan so far. Let's hope Bind keeps having W's in the future. This video is sponsored by my patrons, Mike Saman. Mike Saman. Mike... Mike Saman. Mike Saman. I have one patron. And if you want to spare me the embarrassment of only reading a single name at the end of my videos, and also if you have the money for it, consider supporting me on Patreon. And with that, I bid thee adieu.